Today on the show, we're talking about the Mass Effect characters that left us too soon. Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes behind some of our favorite video games. My name's Abu. And my name's Kevin. And Kevin, we are back again this week talking about Mass Effect after our earth-shattering, groundbreaking first Mass Effect episode. Oh yeah, we are. I mean, it wasn't that earth-shattering, but it, I thought it was a still still a pretty good first episode as far as oh, Mass yeah. Effect is concerned. And there's a ton more to talk about, which is why... We're back at it today. We're going to get a little less philosophical, I'd say, on this one, but definitely uh, this is going to be a fun one. Yeah, I I realized the last episode got pretty, pretty dark, but this one I think is going to be, yeah, I think this one's going to be a little more lighthearted. So today we're going to talk about three minor characters. So they're not the main characters, but they're not exactly inconsequential to the Mass Effect universe. In fact, two of them are like, pretty major to the to the stories in Mass Effect 1 and actually have a little bit of an effect on the rest of the trilogy as well. But we're going to talk about some of the minor characters that, you know, left us too soon, were killed off at some point in the trilogy, and the ones that we d- think deserved a little more time in the limelight. Um, so the first one, the first one here on the chopping block, of course, you can't talk about a minor character in the Mass Effect series without bringing up Corporal Richard L. Jenkins from ah, the very Jenkins. first scene in the very first game. He uh, talk about leaving too soon. Jenkins is uh I think yeah. he, what, is, is he like the first death of the entire game? I'm pretty sure he is. I don't remember the exact opening sequence of the first game, but he's definitely as far as gameplay goes in Mass Effect 1, he is the first person in gameplay to die <laughs> in the in the series. Oh my God. Yeah, so to let, let's talk a little bit of background on Jenkins, just for the folks at home who may not remember him or don't know who he is. So Corporal Richard L. Jenkins is an Alliance Marine, and he worked under Captain Anderson on the Normandy in the very first Mass Effect game. And this is before Shepard is a Spectre. And you're headed to Eden Prime, which is the very first mission in Mass Effect. Shepard is there. Nihilus is there. And Jenkins is, like, really, really optimistic. Would you say that? Like, that's probably the one word that describes him. Oh, I would say, uh, if anything, this dude was amped, man. He was <laughs> yeah. he was so pumped. It was like when you get on the Normandy in the beginning, you're meeting the crew. You get to talk to the crew and everything. And he's, like, the most energetic character. He's like, oh, man, I got my career ahead of me. Like, this is gonna this is going to be great. Like, he's so pumped to be working with Shepard and to have, like, a Spectre on the ship and we're going to go on our first big mission, and it's crazy. And then, you know, all he's got career, he's got his career ahead of him, and then all of a sudden, uh, he's dead. Yep, I mean, that career doesn't go very far, but he doesn't know that yet, you know? When when he's on the Normandy, he doesn't know that. And if I'm going to be completely honest, if I had a legendary Spectre like Nihilus on my ship... Oh, yeah. I had a legendary soldier like Shepard on my ship. I'd be freaking out a little bit too. Like I'd be like, what is this mission that we're going on? What is happening? I'd be a little antsy. So I got to hand it to Jenkins. I don't think I would act all that different in his shoes. Would you? No, I'd probably be super <laughs> amped. I would, I would be so pumped. I mean, he's he's going to be on this epic secret mission with two of the most, like, res- well-respected uh, warriors in the galaxy. So, I would, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd be, I'd be yeah, pretty Yeah, and upset. actually, when, when you talk to him on the ship, you, you talk to him and Dr. Chakwas at the same time mm-hmm. before you land on Eden Prime, and it's very, very obvious that Jenkins grew up sort of really feeding into and swallowing up all the military propaganda about the specters and what they represent and what the military represents and the honor and the so he I, he's very very naive as well definitely optimistic yeah. but the other word i would use to describe him would be naive 
Oh, yeah, he eats that stuff up. I mean, he's like that little kid who was playing toy soldiers, and now he gets to do it in real life. So he's super into it. Yeah, and, and one other thing that is interesting and a little bit tragic, too, and some of the uh, some of the squad mates later on in Mass Effect 3, when they're remembering Jenkins from the first game, bring this up. He dies on his home planet. Eden Prime is his home planet. Oh, man, that's right. Yeah. Oh, wow. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, that's his. He died. Wow. Yeah. Went yeah, home his and life, died. In a, in a very tragic way, his life comes full circle. He started life on Eden Prime, which is a very uh, idyllic and it's a paradise. It, it's one of the human colonies out there that's considered a complete success. Uh, it's one of the most Earth-like colonies, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. So he really grew up in a beautiful paradise and probably had a perfect life. I mean, there's no lore about his upbringing, but if I had to speculate a bit, I would say that he probably grew up like comfortable, middle class, on a beautiful planet, and sort of got bored of that life. Yeah, I mean, if you look at how excited he is, and how young he is too. He's a really he's a pretty young dude. I mean, I would say I would say this is a guy who wanted to be a hero and he oh, saw absolutely. this as like the opportunity to become like the next big hero of of the the alliance. So the last thing I want to say about him is the fact that his name is Richard L. Jenkins. That is very obviously an Easter egg, a reference, whatever you want to call it, to Leroy Jenkins and that incredibly famous and viral video from World of Warcraft from over a decade ago now, I think. It's been a really long time. Did you ever watch that wow. when you were younger? Yeah, I love that video. and You just <laughs> blew my mind because that I, it took me how many years? What is it? Like almost 10 years. I just figured that out. Wow. That, wow, okay, mind Wait, blown. Wait, you didn't know that? No, I had no what? idea, dude. I had no clue. Yeah, no, wow. wow. Okay. Oh, Kevin, his name that is Richard me... L. Jenkins, and he jumps into the line of fire. Oh, man. Leroy wow, it gets, it gets even better. Wow. wow. Yeah, no, that's cool. Wow. Wow, I'm sitting here, like, fully expecting you to be like, well, yeah, duh, boo, like, it's a reference. Like, we all knew no. that. <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> Damn, wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's, That's crazy. crazy. Well, there you go. For for Kevin and the, you know, four other people out in the world who have played Mass Effect and okay, didn't didn't okay. understand that reference. Um, that's what that that's very clearly a reference to that, and I think Bioware has openly admitted to that as well. So, uh, cool. shout out to Leroy that's Jenkins dope. for for ever being one of my favorite internet viral videos. Even though it's fake. Did you also know that? The Leroy Jenkins yes, video. Yes, I knew was that. Staged? I knew it was fake, but it's still beautiful. Yeah. All right, so moving on to our second character that we want to talk about today. He actually had a pretty large impact on the Mass Effect universe. I wouldn't necessarily call him a minor character, but of course he's not part of the main cast and crew. And of course I'm talking about my man, Captain Curry from Vermeer. Man, you love this guy. <laughs> he's awesome. He honestly, from the first moment that I was introduced to him on Vermeer in Mass Effect 1, the first time I played Mass Effect... Instantly, I fell in love, and I was like, I love this guy. And, you know, he has a penchant for giving long-winded speeches, and he's known for being very verbose, but that's immediately why I loved him. And, obviously, he plays a pretty critical role on Vermeer, and then from there, he actually plays a pretty big role in Mass Effect 3 also, depending on the on the decisions that you make leading up to Mass Effect 3. So, I mean, what were your initial thoughts on Curry? Like, was he just another character? Did he, like, he immediately stood out to me, but I don't know if that's the case for everyone. Well, for me, it was kind of, he was the first big Solarian military, like, head honcho kind of guy that you meet. I mean, he was very straight to the point. And don't get me wrong, the dude's speeches were really good. I mean, he, I personally... I say he just likes to hear himself talk, but that's just me. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he wasn't bad. He rallied the troops. He was good at that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't I – ha, I have a soft spot for Krogan's. So, me personally, I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And that, it's interesting you bring up the Krogan's because I actually wanted to discuss some of his, like – Captain Curry's like weird political leanings when it comes to the Genophage and the Krogans. 
Uh, but before we, before we jump into that, for the uninitiated, for the few unlucky folks out there who have never heard Captain Curry give a speech, I want to play a little tiny, tiny clip of his speech from Mass Effect 1. Our influence stopped the Rachni, but before that, we held the line. Our influence stopped the Krogan, but before that, we held the line. Our influence will stop Staren. In the battle today, we will hold the line. So that was just a taste of the inspiration that Captain Curry gives to his troops. And I feel I feel like I just listened to a speech from 300. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or a, a dig at Captain Curry. Hey, look, I said the guy can make a speech. Don't get me wrong. That's true. It's not bad. That's true. So j- just to give a little bit of background on who he is and why he's important to the story, for those of you that may not know, in summary, he is a uh, he's a captain in the Salarian military. More specifically, he's in the STG. So he, he's he's the best of the best. He's essentially the, the Navy SEALs for the Salarians. He's a captain. He has a team on Vermeer, and he actually discovers Saren's plan on Vermeer to create Krogan that are resistant to the genophage. And him and his team help Shepard fight Saren and stop him from creating this Krogan army that's resistant to the genophage. I would say the Vermeer um, mission was probably one of my biggest but also easiest decisions to make just because, like I said, I have a soft spot for Krogans. So I was all up with Rex. I was all... Con- I was... I agreed with Rex, like, hey, you know, the genophase should end. Um, but I also knew, I mean, this this dude is a leader, so having him on your team is a pretty big deal. So I didn't want to lose that either. I do I do want to point out that Curry he has sort of a weird uh, relationship with the genophage, right? So in Mass Effect 1, his major role is to essentially continue the genophage and to stop a potential cure, which is why Rex is so pissed off. And he seems pretty pretty anti-Krogan. In Mass Effect 3, you interact with him on Sir Kesh, which is the, the secret facility where female Krogan are being kept, and he is part of the squad that brought those female Krogan to that uh, secret facility. So indirectly, yeah, he wants to protect them completely. Yes, and then, and then in that mission, you're right, he, he helps... Shepard protects the one female Krogan that's left alive. So it's interesting that he, I don't know if he necessarily does a complete flip-flop because the Reapers sort of would change anyone's mind, I think. Mm-hmm. But he, I think he does have a little bit of a soft spot or at least grows a little bit of a soft spot when it comes to the plight of the Krogan. I think he grows as a character off screen, but I also think the Salarians as a whole have grown tremendously from game one to game three. Like, their entire viewpoint on the genophage kind of changes. Now, I know I said that I think he likes to hear himself talk a little bit, and I'm pretty sure this is your third point, but I will give him this. Salarians only live about, what, 40 years, right? Yeah, they have shorter lifespans than humans. This guy, in every single game that he's in, basically wants to just sacrifice himself for the great for the greater good yeah and like that's a pretty big deal i mean if you only live for 40 years your life is pretty important to you time is uh very expensive yeah i agree absolutely i mean in the first game he can die on vermeyer if you don't follow the correct steps so he essentially sacrifices himself trying to stop saren's plan and then in mass effect 3 when he comes back on Sir Kesh, he doesn't die. He actually helps you get the female Krogan off planet. But later on, when Cerberus is attacking the Citadel, if you don't have Thane in your squad, he is the one that takes the bullet for the Salarian council member that is uh, being attacked by Kai Lang. So he sacrifices himself in that case. So I agree. I think it's admirable, and we have to give this to Kurahi. He's all about bravado, but at the end of the day, I think the most admirable thing about him is his willingness to give his life for a cause that's greater than his. I mean, this guy gets it. He understands, like, hey, it's not about me. It's about everything right now. It's about everybody. For sure. And I, it, I will say I respect him for that. Yeah, absolutely. So our third person that we want to talk about and the final person we want to talk about today 
is matriarch Benezia. Ugh. Liara Tassoni's mom, one of the most annoying bosses in the first Mass Effect game. It's yeah, she's she's uh she's a pain, man. She I it took me forever to beat her. But I will say this. Her story is pretty cool, especially reading more about it um, now, kind of refreshing my memory. Yeah, I will say, you know what? I understand where Liara gets it, where, where Liara gets the badassness from, because this, uh, yeah, her mom's pretty, her mom's pretty freaking cool. Oh, I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah, she in Mass Effect One, she might have been a little over her head, but looking into her history and her background and reading up on her lore in preparation for this episode. I would also probably, like, try to stop Saren. So the basis of Bene- uh, of Benezi in the first game is that she has joined up with Saren, not because she agrees with Saren's plan, but because she thinks she can convince him to not go through with that plan. She wants to essentially stop Saren's plan from the inside. That, of course, doesn't work because of a little thing called Reaper indoctrination, but she essentially joins up with Saren for a noble cause. And I think that's admirable. And I think if anyone, Matriarch Benezia, one of the most legendary Asari, she's looked up to as a, as a religious leader, as a teacher. She is one of the most powerful Asari out there. And if anyone would be able to stop Saren from the inside, it probably would have been her. Yeah, she's a, she's a crazy powerful biotic too. I mean... She not only has physical power, but she also has power the power of the people. I mean, she was a spiritual leader, too. She was a huge in- influence on the government for the Asari. She, this was a very successful person right over here. Oh, definitely, definitely. And that actually leads into the first question that I wanted to toss at you and sort of discuss. It, since she's been around for so long, one of her major viewpoints, and you learn this through, um, you don't really learn this in the first game, but you learn it in the third game when Liara finally meets her dad. You actually meet the Asari that Matriarch Benezia mated with and uh, eventually created Liara with. One one of the reasons that they split up was because they had differences on how they wanted the future of the Asari to be. Yeah. How they wanted the Asari to sort of tackle the, the next millennia. And Benezia comes from the camp of well, the Asari are one of the longest living races in the galaxy, and we should have a larger say in what the galaxy does. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would say that they are very, very impactful just by being the oldest race. I, I can understand why they can view a race like humans, for instance, having so much power in the galactic government with, it, with such little time. I, would, I could understand getting a little pissed off about that. But do you think they should have a greater say in what happens just because they live longer and have been around longer than the other races? Do you, do, do you think that should equate to actual more power in the galactic government? Well, I would say you have to define power because really they have some of the most advanced technology, even by Solarian standards. They have a vast amount of knowledge. They're just really influential already. And they've helped. They've even helped like other races go along. So yeah, I would say I, yeah. I can see. I can see where you're coming from, but I don't know. I I feel like I would have to disagree with Benezia's philosophy because I think that could get a little dangerous though too. Yeah. Well, I mean, my main reason for disagreeing with her on that is we run into Asari all throughout the galaxy in all three games that do stupid shit. Like, just because they yeah. lived forever doesn't mean that they're immediately this, like, epically wise and mature and incredibly intelligent race. Like, they're still, they still make, you know, quote unquote, human mistakes, sorry mistakes. So I, I would probably disagree with Benezia on her philosophy. So the final thing that I want to talk about when it comes to matriarch Benezia is the fact that she's Liara's mom. And that's a pretty big part of the first Mass Effect game. And obviously in Mass Effect 3, when Liara meets her dad slash not dad and talks to talks to her, you learn so much more about Benezia and Liara and, you know, the the Benezia's partner. And the interesting part of that is it's pretty taboo in Asari culture to mate with another Asari. But 
Benezia was such a badass, she said, fuck the rules. I'm just going to mate with whoever I love. So then we get Liara. But the interesting thing, and I want to get your thoughts on this, and there's no lore on this, so we don't know any of this as a fact, but Mm -hmm. what kind of mom do you think Benezia was? It's really weird because I only know the Benezia who was semi-indoctrinated. I don't really know the one behind, like you said. I would say she was kind of strict, maybe. You know those parents who just kind of drill it into their kid's head? Like, they just, those parents who just drill, you got to do well in school, you got to do this, and they just, like, oh, you know, for me, it'd be like, oh, man, I got a 98 on my test. My dad would be really proud of me, and my mom would be like, hey, where'd the other two points go? You know what I mean? (laughs) I feel like that's kind of how she'd be. Um, But also, I mean, think about it. When she dies, she says something to her where she calls, she says something to Liara where she calls her, like, little wing. Now, granted, that's a reference to something else. That's an Easter egg itself, but... It kind of shows to me that she really does care about her kid and she, you know, there definitely was some affection there. Yeah. I think Liara chose to do what she did when it comes to studying the Protheans and venturing out on her own and then eventually joining up with Shepard. I think Liara sort of went through that arc in her life, probably because she lived under the shadow of such an amazing Asari. Like, you are matriarch Benezia's daughter you have to live up to that and i think benezia genuinely loved her daughter and i absolutely agree with your assessment of the little wing comment when she dies that shows that there's some true affection there between the two so i think she genuinely loved liara and cared for her at the same time i think she was probably extremely strict but mostly because she cared, right? Like all parents are strict to some extent, but I have a feeling that Benezia, just by the nature of who she is, I think she would have pushed Liara quite a bit more than other Asari parents might have. Well, like when you find the beacon on the Asari homeworld and Liara is really bummed out about it, she thinks like, you know, why did my mother hide this from me? And she gets really kind of upset. Edie says it right there. She says that she thinks it's, kind of it was her desire to protect Liara from the consequences if anything happens and I think even Liara in the game she liked that answer and she said okay I, I like that answer that's a, you know I respect that I can understand that and I think that's that's kind of what it is it, it she she was strict she was smart she was powerful but she cared about her kid yeah absolutely that that shows some true affection there for Liara I think the one knock against Benezia that I would have outside of her Horrible, horrible boss fight in Mass Effect 1. The major character flaw with Benezia is, I think, her hubris. How cocky she is. She thinks that she can single-handedly turn Saren away from his huge, huge plan with the Reapers. Well, I will say this. I can kind of understand it, though. She is the only one who actually was able to resist indoctrination fully 100%. She was so powerful that she was able to have a part of herself in her mind. Don't get me wrong. She was indoctrinated, but she was able to take a piece of her mind and kind of, you know, set it aside and block indoctrination from that. Because when she does die, we talk to that side of her. We talk to the real, the real side of Benezia. Right. We get this tiny, tiny glimpse of the true Benezia. The Benezia she's like, And that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty that that shows just how powerful she is, and so I kind of can understand why she thought, oh, I can I can handle Saren's plan. That's easy. I can make him go back to being a good guy. But I mean, I get it. Don't get me wrong. She was she she screwed up, but I think I can I can kind of get it. Yeah, that's true. You bring up a good point. I think that that redeems her a little bit for me is the fact that she was strong enough to resist Reaper indoctrination, which Saren, one of the best specters in history could not. So out of the three characters that we talked about today, Kevin, which one would you want to grab a drink with? (laughs) Um, Well, let's see. Hmm. I would say, hmm. Well, I definitely don't think I'd want to get a drink with Jenkins (laughs) only because I don't think he'd shut up. I mean, the dude would just be, like, going on and oh, on and on and so on. And I'd be right. like, all right, can we talk about something else? Can we just talk about something else, please? So I don't I don't think I'd I, – I, I don't drink, but I don't think I'd go – I don't know if I'd want to go out with Jenkins. Too eager. 
Karahi would just want to hear himself talk, <laughs> and I would just kind of be like, dude, you know, it's not about you, you know, like... When you're on a date, you know, I'm not saying I'd be dating him, but if you're on a date, you, you want to let the other person talk. Yeah, and that, yeah. I, it would be, that I, would, I wouldn't go for a second one. Um, I would, I, yeah, I'd say Benezia. I mean, wow. I could, I feel like if I asked her a question, she'd have a really good uh, answer. Now, granted, I'm talking not the uh, piece of crap that I had to kill. Right. Yeah, not the indoctrinated Benezia. And I will say the, the this. true Benezia. She would, she would not shut up during that boss fight either. So, mm, I'd say pre-indoctrination. I, I, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go out with her. There you I'd, go. I'd get, I'd get that's, a a, that's a solid answer. And, you know, she, she can impart a thousand years of wisdom on you and maybe teach you, teach you a thing or two. That's fascinating. So, I think my answer for that would... I just got to give it to my boy, Captain Curahee. I love him. He's inspirational. He'd give me a few pointers on how to give a great speech. He'd probably save the day in some fashion. And then, you know, while we're at dinner, while while we're grabbing a drink, he'd probably figure out some way to martyr himself and save the day and get himself killed. <laughs> so I think, it would, I think that would result in a pretty interesting night out with Captain Curahee. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. We want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of the show. Be sure to connect with us on Twitter at lore underscore party and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.